Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. My name is Katie Pham. I'm an Associate Director for Development and Industry Engagement here at UC San Diego Career Center. And today I would like to present to you rewards of a service driven career, featuring an amazing panel of recruiters from nonprofits themselves. First up, I would like to introduce Allison Aguero. She's a recruiter from City Air. Next up with us is Xavier Maciel, a recruiter from Teach for America. Also joining us is Quinn Walker, a recruiter from AmeriCorps. And last but not least, we have Anastasia Benikova, a recruiter from Peace Corps. Okay. Awesome. So first off, we're going to start with AmeriCorps. Hi, everybody. So yes, I'm here representing AmeriCorps and more specifically the AmeriCorps National Civilian Community Corps program. But I'll touch a little bit about AmeriCorps in general. AmeriCorps is a federal government agency that's kind of the premier volunteer um, service component of, of the United States. And it's uh, AmeriCorps opportunities are often referred to as the, the best kept secret of the United States government. And obviously we don't want that to be a secret because we want as many young people um, of all ages actually, but in my program specifically targeted to 18 and 26 year olds to know about their opportunities to serve, um, to gain skills, to get money to help pay for graduate school or to pay back student loans that you already have. Um, and a little bit about me. So. When I was 18, I graduated from high school and I was kind of presented with the three options that, that all of us are presented with. You can either go directly into the workforce, you can go directly into college, or you can go to the military. Um, and at the time, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to study in college. And I felt like by investing so much financially into that experience when I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do, um, I felt like I needed essentially like a gap year, something to kind of gain some skills and experiences, travel, um, learn more about my passions, and then also to get some money for college, I decided to do an AmeriCorps program and I did a uh, city year specifically, the one that Allison will be speaking about. And so I left my Northern California town where uh, I was born and raised um, and went to New Hampshire, a little uh, state in New England, a place that I had never been to before and had this amazing experience in AmeriCorps. Um, when that finished, I went to school and had that paid for in part by my education award that AmeriCorps and Triple C, the program I'm speaking about today, provides as well as City Year provides. Um, and so that made it more affordable. And then I studied public administration in undergrad. I had this really great study abroad experience my junior year in South Africa, which led me to want to do something like AmeriCorps, but in an international realm, which led me to the Peace Corps, where I served in the, the tiny but mighty Republic of Moldova for a little over two and a half years. And Moldova's right there on the border between Ukraine and Romania, um, and had such an amazing experience in the Peace Corps. Um, I went on to work for the Peace Corps after that. Um, in a similar um, role as Anastasia, as a, as a recruiter, and then got the opportunity to be a community relations specialist with AmeriCorps and Triple C, the program I'll be speaking about this afternoon, which in hindsight, I mean, I loved my city year experience, but I wish I could have, I would have known about N Triple C because I think I might have taken a second gap year, or maybe I would have done N Triple C before Peace Corps um, after college because it's really a uh, session adventure and you get exposure to so many different things and so my role as a community relations specialist is essentially a recruitment uh, elected official outreach so kind of like a, a lobbyist but telling all the good stories about the work that we're doing with AmeriCorps and Triple C and then um, communications so like writing press releases and doing media advisories and speaking um, to the media so we can go to the next slide there and this is the program that I work for now and represent the National Civilian Community Corps. Their mission is to develop leaders and strengthen communities through team-based national service. So unlike a lot of other AmeriCorps programs, you work on a team of approximately eight to 12 young adults, anywhere from the ages of 18 to 26 years old. 
um, and you travel around the country essentially doing short-term high-impact service projects and you do all of that work as a team so you're eating together every day you're working together every day you're debriefing your day and having team dinners um, and those are the the individuals that you spend your 10 months of service with and so as you can imagine you build really strong relationships and friendships and the fact that the ages are varied from 18 to 26 i mean if you're um, I would say about 50, a little over 50% already have a college degree, but some of our participants are kind of maybe taking a gap year from community college, or some of them are even coming from um, right out of high school. And so I always found that when I was 18 doing an AmeriCorps program city year, that those who had already gone to college who were a bit older, 23, 24, were definitely like role models to me and, and helped prepare me for my next step after I finished AmeriCorps. And I feel like the same um, happens with NCCC program with the different age ranges. And also people are from all over the country. So you have a young person serving from Seattle, Washington, and they're working beside a peer from Birmingham, Alabama, who, and there might be somebody from your team who's from Miami, Florida, and somebody from your team from rural West Virginia and somebody from Boston, Massachusetts. And so just building that social cohesion of everybody's united by a mission to like make a difference in the community, develop themselves as a leader. And despite some of their different lived experiences, they're able to form these really strong connections and bonds, which I think about our country now and some of the issues that we have with social cohesion. And I'm like, if everybody would just do a, a year of AmeriCorps, I think that would make a big difference in kind of unifying us as a population, but we can go to the next slide. Yeah, and so, yep, so the basics of the program, I had mentioned that it's 18 to 26 years old, although as a team leader, you can be over the age of 26. That's, <clears throat> that role um, is a, a bit different, uh, and mostly the fact that they have a college degree, but I would still think that on average, that the age of a team leader is probably like 25, 26, 27, um, but there is technically no upper age limit. And that would be a really great experience for any of you who are listening who already have some kind of leadership experience, be it through a student organization um, at UC San Diego, or maybe you're a president or vice president of a student organization, or maybe you have already been really active in volunteer projects in your community, and you kind of want that um, more robust leadership experience then I would say you can apply to be a team leader. You do all the same things that a regular core member does, but you have the added um, responsibilities of managing the interpersonal dynamics of a group of young people, which can be complicated, um, as well as managing the team budget, um, food budget, things of that nature. So it is 10 months, and I'll also talk, uh, talk about our, um, kind of our sister program, FEMA Core, which is a 12-month program but the, the structures are very similar. Um, and again, eight to 10 members, sometimes it can be up to 12. And again, you travel work as a team. And we have four campuses, which we run the NCCC program out of. So I represent the Pacific region, which is um, a very beautiful region. So we have teams that go to Alaska, Hawaii, Montana, um, obviously all over California. We have teams that are serving in San Diego area right now. Um, and uh, that is the campus is based out of Sacramento, but you only spend about a month in the campuses for training before you're deployed to do these short-term high-impact projects all over the country. So you don't really uh, go back to the main campus very often. And you can go to the next slide. And then this is just an example of where our campuses are in the regions that we represent. Um, and so just as an example, yeah. And we can go to the next slide. And then there's two real programs that I'm speaking about today. Uh, the traditional program, which is kind of your uh, hands-on, uh, more of a rugged program where you're building houses, you're responding to natural disasters, you're working at food banks, you're um, doing environmental restoration at national parks, national forests, you're doing infrastructure improvement at summer camps that haven't seen campers for over two years, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, and we're getting them back up um, to be able to safely house 
um, campers. I mean, the experiences that you'll get in the traditional four are so varied, right? So you leave, let's just say you were in Sacramento, you leave that experience after a month of training, you go to Bozeman, Montana, where you build houses um, with Habitat for Humanity for two months. When that ends, you hop into your 15 passenger government van. Every project that you go to, you go on these epic road trips. So you hop into your van after two months in Montana and drive to Joshua Tree National Park, where you work for the Park Service doing trail mitigation and restoration for two months. Once that's over, you may get deployed to rural Nevada to work for um, a boys and girls club doing after school programming and assistance, as well as infrastructure improvements at their facilities. And then for the last two months, you may be uh, in Oakland, California, working for a food bank kind of serving um, the most needy individuals of that, um, of that community who are facing. And so you're going to all these different locations around the country um, for the duration of your service. And then this is just an example of all of that type of work. The other program that you saw on there was FEMA Corps, same type of model. You travel um, around the country working on different projects, but all within the realm of disaster management. And it's instead of working with different sponsors like Habitat or a food bank, you work with FEMA. So you work with different FEMA offices, FEMA headquarters in DC, FEMA in Louisiana, FEMA in North Texas. And that's more of a um, internship experience, more of a administrative experience, so less outdoor type of work. Now, we can go to the next slide. And this again, just some examples of the different types of projects that we do. I kind of highlighted what that would look like, right? So building houses in Montana, building trails in Joshua Tree National Park, doing after school programming in Nevada, working at a food bank in Northern California. Those are just some of the many different projects that you can get involved with. We do do a lot of disaster response and recovery. So we have teams that are working in Paradise, California, still doing long-term um, fire fuels mitigation after what happened in um, the campfire. We have teams um, that deploy to Oregon and in communities that were hit by wildfires doing um, you know, fire fuel reduction control firms, things of that nature. And we can go to the next screen. Um, and then FEMA Corps, this is the other one I was program uh, talking about, mostly office-based, mostly administrative, but about 50% of our FEMA Corps graduates go on to get permanent positions with FEMA. So if you're interested in getting your foot in the door in the federal government, you're like, how do I do that? I want to work on emergency management. I care about helping communities recover from disaster and survivors get the needs, um, you know, get their needs met after a disaster event. Doing a FEMA Corps is really like a one-year internship in order to get your foot in the door with a FEMA career. And you can go to the next slide. And then the benefits of both programs, um, obviously you're gonna have a lot of resume skills and advantages. So um, just having that, that year of experience on your resume, uh, be it with the FEMA core program or the traditional core program, it's gonna set you apart from your peers. When you are asked a question in an interview, for example, of tell me about a time where you had to overcome a, an obstacle or a challenging situation, I mean, armed with hundreds of stories after that. Um, travel the country. Again, I mean, this is, we've had members who, who participate in this program who maybe you're from California, maybe you're from SoCal, you, you go to San Diego, but you've never been to Hawaii, you've never been to Alaska, you've never been to Montana, um, and especially some of these states in the rural areas. Um, you really have an opportunity to, to travel and explore the country and kind of also build some um, relationships with these individuals. Uh, and then obviously our work uh, makes a big difference. So because responding to disaster, food insecurity, et cetera. Uh, I know I'm taking a lot of time, so we'll kind of go through these a little bit quicker. Here. And then, um, yeah, you get an education award. It's a little over $6,500 right now. Uh, when I did AmeriCorps, the city year program, uh, my university matched my education award. I think that's pretty common for a merit-based scholarship, for example, for graduate school, um, a lot of times they'll match your education award or give you additional aid because you did something like AmeriCorps. And then all of your living costs are paid through this program, food, housing, living expenses. You really don't have to worry about any of that. So if you had 
no money in savings, for example, and you joined AmeriCorps and C or the FEMA Corps program, uh, you know, you're going to be taken care of with the bi-weekly bi living stipend at a, at a one at the end, and there's no um, current uh, expenses while you're in the program. All right, so next one, almost done here. I'll follow up on this. This is our application cycle. We're always accepting applications, but you'll definitely see my email in the chat and we'll maybe have a chance to answer some questions at the end. So I can always talk about the, the application process. Other than a team leader, there really are no special skills you needed, uh, needed to be a participant in this program. We will train you. Mainly it's just a desire to make a difference and flexibility. Uh, positive attitude. Those are things that we really look for as far as technical skills. Um, the only thing we would really be looking for would be the leadership experience for team leaders. But other than that, we'll provide you with the training. All right, thank you. Thanks, Quinn, um, and thanks for shouting out City Year. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a bit about City Year. We are also an AmeriCorps program, so I think as Quinn mentioned, AmeriCorps is kind of like the big umbrella of national service, and there are hundreds, if not thousands, of opportunities, including NCCC, City Year. I know Teach for America falls under it as well, um, and I know someone asked about VISTA, um, which we can probably talk about a little bit later. Um, but yeah, I'm here to talk about City Year, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so City Year is um, a 11 month commitment. And as a City Year AmeriCorps member, you are, we like to call them student success coaches. Um, so you are a tutor, mentor, and role model to your students. As a City Year AmeriCorps member, you're placed on a team of about eight to 10 other first year AmeriCorps members. And then you and your team are paired with a school. And that's the school that you work with for the full 11 months. Um, and while you're at the school, you work alongside a partner teacher. So you're not alone in the classroom with your students. Um, you collaborate with that partner teacher. Um, I worked very closely with mine, have had a meeting with her every day to kind of go over the schedule. Um, and that was something that I, I really enjoyed about the role was um, I wasn't quite ready to manage um, a classroom on my own. So I liked having that um, support in the classroom, um, but you are there for your students. So you provide that additional um, support in the classroom for the, your students, maybe while the teacher is going over the lesson, kind of looking around, ensuring that the students are understanding what's going on. Um, maybe you're pulling out your students to do one-on-one -on -one or small group interventions, um, providing social emotional to support to your students. Um, this can come in the form of maybe a lunch buddies program where you invite a student to have lunch with you every day and kind of, you know, chat with them about like, hey, I noticed your head was down, you know, this morning, is everything okay? Is there anything you wanna talk to me about? Um, you also will utilize data to monitor student progress. So when I served with City Year, um, we would get data at the beginning, middle, and end of the school year to kind of see like, okay, the students, you know, improved in their reading literacy, but maybe um, they need a little bit more help in their math. So I need to focus on that in my sessions with them. Um, in addition to, you know, providing all of that support during the school day, you and your team also run an after school program, which is typically an hour of a study hall space and then an hour of enrichment. And I tell folks um, enrichment can be whatever you and your team want. So on my team, we had a lot of really artsy people. So we did a lot of really fun art projects with the students, um, but we also noticed that our school's STEM program wasn't the best. So we would do a lot of like science experiments, um, you know, try to get support that, you know, um, for the, the students. Um, and then you and your team will also do whole school activities and invite the families to come to those. So we did things like um, a movie night, um, a culture night where we had to, you know, the families come and bring like dishes from their culture that maybe they serve at holidays, um, super fun. Um, and then, uh, and then also like events for the school and the staff. So we do like teacher appreciation, pep rallies, things like that. So lots of different ways to be involved in the school. Um, and then you can go to the next slide, Katie. Um, so again, it is an 11 month full-time commitment. So someone asked about um, being able to serve while, while in school. Um, we don't recommend it because it is, you know, full-time you are there at the school for sometimes 10 hours a day because you're there before the students get there and you leave after the last student has left your after school program. Um, and you, I, I would say you wanna focus your time on, on this opportunity too. Um, and then um, you get to work on a team of 
young, diverse individuals. So there is an age limit. Um, I think along with, with the NCCC, um, our age limit is 17 to 25 because we like to have that near peer um, model with our programming. Um, and then we um, work with third through ninth grade students as well. Um, and then some of the benefits include um, you get to select where you serve. We serve in 29 locations across the country. Um, you get a biweekly living stipend, as well as a relocation allowance, which you would all be eligible for um, being from UC San Diego. Um, and then we also provide medical, dental, vision benefits, um, student loan, loan forbearance. So if you have any loans from undergrad, you can put those into forbearance during your service year. And then um, any of the interest that's accrued will be paid for by AmeriCorps. So you don't have to pay those loans during your service year. And then um, we also offer that $6,000 Siegel Education Award. There are some schools that will match that as well. Um, and then we also have over 100 university partnerships, which offer scholarships specifically for city or alumni. So you're not competing with any other folks for these scholarships. And those can range from like a 10% scholarship to a full ride. Um, and those university partnerships also, um, because we're not exclusively uh, you know, open to just education majors, we accept all majors. Um, so we want our university partnerships to reflect that diversity as well. So we have a lot of partnerships, obviously with education programs, but also with social work, counseling, public health, public policy, law, and BA programs. Um, and we're constantly um, updating those as well. So um, definitely a really great option if you are thinking about grad school, but maybe um, are trying to figure out how to pay for it. Um, and that is a lifetime benefit too. Um, so once you're a city or alumni, you are always eligible for those scholarships. Um, and then our final deadline for the 2022-2023 academic year is May 6th, so coming up pretty quick. Um, our application is pretty short and sweet. There's um, four essay questions, um, an optional but highly recommended resume, and then a professional reference. Um, they will just need to fill out an electronic form on your behalf, not like a letter of recommendation that'll come through their email. And then all of our interviews are conducted on the phone. So. Just make sure you've got a good connection, no, no outside um, sounds that's gonna interrupt your, your interviews, but happy to answer any other questions in the chat or at the end of um, our, our session today. Hi everyone, um, again, I'm Anastasia from Peace Corps. I'll be brief, um, uh, just a little historical note. I, I'm a product of Peace Corps, I uh, was, living in Kazakhstan and um, Peace Corps had a post there and I had Peace Corps volunteer teacher who would come and uh, help us learn English and so here I am now working for Peace Corps and also volunteered for Peace Corps in three different countries. Uh, we are a government agency and we do have two-year programs uh, for volunteers to come and serve in a variety of roles uh, thank you. Uh, and um, if you go to the next slide, I think I'll, 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 it will be easier with the visuals. Uh, yeah, so like I said, um, it's a two-year commitment, um, which basically means that you have to have a bachelor degree uh, by the time you leave, um, and uh, you have to be ready to go and serve for two years. It's it, Here it says 27 months, so th the three additional months is actually um, dedicated uh, at the very beginning for pre-service training where we will make sure that you learn the local language, culture, um, any technical knowledge required for your service, uh, as well as any safety, security, and health uh, questions. Um, up until 2020, we did have over 60 countries um, in our orbit, but then the COVID-19 pandemic started and we had to evacuate all the volunteers, including myself. I was serving in, in Armenia at that time. But the good news is that we're finally starting to re-emerge. Uh, we actually sent the, our first two cohorts uh, three weeks ago, one to Zambia and one to Dominican Republic. So we are reopening and it's very exciting. Um, like I mentioned, the, uh, Peace Corps is basically just great for cultural immersion and, and it's one of our goals uh, in order to fulfill our mission to promote peace and friendship among people. Uh, so uh, cultural exchange is very important here. You will be basically talking about the way you grew up in, in, the, in the States, where you went to school, what you ate, what you celebrated. And then when uh, you finish with your service, 
and you return, you're going to share your experiences with your family and friends. We do have um, six main sectors. Uh, as you can see, education has been the biggest one where um, it's usually teaching English or uh, being a teacher trainer for English teachers in a variety of countries. But then there is a very small yet very, very hard to fill subsection of math and science teachers. We always want math and science teachers. It's, it's, we never can recruit enough of them. Um, youth in development um, focuses on working with youth, but it doesn't mean with kids. It's actually working with young adults um, up until like 35 years of age. And you work on a variety of projects with them, starting from business literacy or life skills to um, maybe community development projects or anything that, again, anything that's community uh, related and community based. Uh, environment uh, volunteers uh, work on a variety of environmental issues. Uh, it can be recycling, it can be deforestation, it can be um, uh, river cleanups, etc. But uh, as I'm saying uh, these examples, most of the time volunteers would actually do is to train, facilitate, and mentor. So uh, this is very uh, also like teaching heavy um, role for you. Um, back in the time, back in the day, volunteers used to go and like build libraries with their own bare hands. Um, I think those days are over, although that doesn't mean that you cannot uh, build things with your own hands. <laughs> you actually can. And um, in health sector, for example, uh, where volunteers work on public health outreach uh, with malaria prevention, HIV prevention, nutrition classes, etc., uh, there is a subdivision of that sector that's called WASH, uh, and that is where volunteers are uh, placed in communities that need um, clean water. And that would mean building a pump or building a well, and um, that can actually mean that you may want to, you, you may help building it. Uh, so agriculture is another one sector where volunteers would work with farm groups, women's groups, and um, uh, business literacy, uh, working with uh, local materials to um, have income generating um, projects. Uh, I was an agriculture volunteer in Ghana, and so I taught how to make soap and batik using uh, local resources like palm oil and uh, local wax. Uh, community development, community economic development, that's sort of like an all-encompassing sector where volunteers would work with uh, community members, um, local government officials, maybe schools or youth groups on community development on, again, it could be business literacy, it could be some sort of a community project. And um, again, the key word here is community. It's very community uh, heavy, community focused. It's a grassroots uh, development approach that we what, that we do. We do not just come in and 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 do start doing things without actually living in the community, learning about the people, learning about um, local culture, um, and then figuring out what can work, what what may not work. And a lot of projects actually don't work, but. <laughs> Um, the ones that I emerge uh, uh, are something that you should be proud of. Um, yeah, so um, benefits are similar to what my fellow colleagues mentioned. There, there is a living stipend when, while you are serving. We fly you to the country of service and back uh, when you finish. Uh, we have got a great medical coverage. You, you are covered while you're there. We have a medical officer at each post uh, stationed. We do have a student loan deferral. Uh, and you do get vacation, um, uh, uh, housing um, either is covered or you get an additional rent monies. And then after service, when you return, you get a, a nice chunk of money for sort of get used to American way of life because it is fairly costly. Um, we have a great grad school program that's called Coverdell Fellowship. It's in over 200 universities and it's a lifetime uh, benefit as a return Peace Corps volunteer. Um, and the fellowship uh, varies uh, from university to university, from the full ride, full tuition uh, waiver, and some additional uh, benefits to a partial tuition waiver, depending on the program, but it's a great benefit nonetheless. Uh, federal employment advantage includes the fact that for one year after you finish your service, you will be able to apply for a variety of federal jobs. And this is what actually I did. I, this is how I got a job with Peace Corps after I finished my service. Uh, so if you do want to get your foot in the door with, uh, the, with the federal employment, this is, this is a good benefit. Um, in the normal pre-COVID wor world, uh, it, it did take 9 to 12 months um, 
uh, for uh, application timeline and uh, it's been kind of skewed lately but again we are um, sort of coming back to normal timelines and so that hopefully will uh, return to uh, nine to nine months to 12 months um, the application packet the main two parts include the uh, 500 word essay of why you want to uh, join Peace Corps and, and what coping strategies you would use for um, service, during service. Um, the tailored resume, and we love uh, when you include volunteering, facilitating, mentoring, and leadership experience. We, we love people who served with AmeriCorps, with City Year, with Teach for America. So if you gain that experience already, please put it in the resume. Um, we, we actually... Um, need only two references from you. So I don't know, maybe three was uh, an old rule. And um, uh, if you could um, get to the next sl uh, slide, Katie, uh, I'll just show you like a, a sort of a, a map, a world map of application. Um, the, you know, the first two steps are, are fairly easy. And as a recruiter, I can actually assist you in making your application competitive by looking at your resume, looking at your motivation statement before you hit apply button, um, to again make sure that you are um, ready, like that you your your talents, your your skills, your experiences are, are really really shining through. And then on the step four, uh, during the interview, um, me or uh, another uh, recruiter who will be representing your area can help you prep for the interview. Um, that would last about um, an hour and a half. Uh, where they would explore questions on living in ambiguous conditions or, um, you know, uh, overcoming challenges, etc. Um, yeah, so um, this is fairly uh, kind of easy to follow timeline. Uh, each step uh, usually uh, is just uh, kind of, you get just instructions before each step, so no need to worry about, you know, onboarding while you're still applying, for example. However, I would also encourage you to um, get in touch. I'm going to drop uh, a link, um, check in link again, or uh, simply go to peacecore.gov. We've got a lot of events. We have a lot of uh, uh, return volunteer panels discussing their past experiences so you could get more knowledge. You can talk to the recruiter in your area. Uh, you can also find it through the peacecore.gov. Um, and uh, yeah, enjoy. Thank you. Okay. Hey, what's up, y'all? So I'm representing Teach for America. Um, just some background on me before we get started. I also did do Teach for America. I did work for City Year for a bit too. I used to manage core members for them, so that was amazing. Um, loved loved the experience, you know. Um, but yeah, so Teach for America. So I ended up teaching uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. I taught economics and U.S. history to 11th, 12th graders. Love it. Um, I always love speaking to UCSD students. Uh, we have some in our current pipeline um, that applied as juniors and um, that will be accepting our offers for this coming year. So a lot of impact. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Yeah, so just a quick rundown because um, I know I really want to get to questions too. So when it comes to Teach for America, our mission is to eradicate education and equity, right? Um, super simple, super basic. What we know is that potential is equally distributed, right? But main thing is opportunity is not, which is why we only place our teachers into Title I schools, meaning schools that have over 40% students that are on free or reduced lunch. Maybe you guys are familiar with that term, right? So here's some logistics about what our program is. We do have opportunities if you are a freshman, sophomore, junior. Um, I answered that in a couple of the answer thing, so feel free to sign up for that. It should The application for that should open up in a month, um, and I will be on that team, so we might be having a conversation in the future. But um, some more stuff about this opportunity specifically, it is for uh, after graduation, right? Our current recruitment season is over, so, um, you know, if you do potentially want to apply to us and you are a senior, you could always apply as a professional. They open up in August. Right. So for us, it is a two two year commitment. So it's full time commitment. You know, you're not a teaching assistant. You're not like anything like that. You are a full time teacher in your classroom. Right. So you will be responsible for 30 to 120 students, depending on the grade level that you teach. Right. Um, and we do provide training um, and professional development. We accept all majors. And again, like you will be paid on a full time teacher salary. Right. Um, and we do have over 40 cities, I believe 30 at this point. A um, couple were making alumni regions for our alumni. 
um, you, you would get the benefits of being a teacher. For example, if you are in New York City, you'll be getting those benefits. If you are in California, same thing, plus that salary, right? Um, and during our two years, you will be on the path to getting your teaching credential and or master's, right? So for me, I was able to get my master's in education for free because of the partnership that we had um, with my specific region in Phoenix through Arizona State. And we also do provide that Siegel Award. Um, it fluctuates anywhere between, I don't know, somewhere around like 5,000 to 6,300, depending on like, I don't know, a bunch of other factors. Um, and we do help with transitioning, right? So we realize like, hey, maybe you are in California, but you're interested in going back home, maybe home for you is New York City, right? That's a lot of costs. So we do provide you all our core members with $5,000 worth of transitional funding. And if you are on a Pell Grant, um, an extra $5,000, right? And uh, our application, like I mentioned earlier, we will be opening up in August for seniors and professionals. Um, juniors, we do accept as well, um, but that's later on in uh, our cycle. And uh, essentially the first part of the application is gonna stay the same between this year and next year. It's just two short answer questions, 300 words, resume, and uh, eventually like a professional reference, right? I believe it's gonna be two of them, but that's like after your interview. The first portion is just those two essays and a resume. Um, and if you do make it to the interview process, right, because we are pretty uh, selective, um, it's going to be a case, a five minute mini lesson, um, you teach anything you want, and a behavioral interview. And then after that, you get your offer, um, with, and uh, you'll get the opportunity, essentially, to tell us where you want to live, uh, what you want to teach, and what grade level you want to teach, right? It's one of the most common questions. Uh, so you tell us that, and then we see what we have open, right? So the sooner you apply, the more chances you are to get what you want, right? So our applications do open up August and then September and then throughout the entire year. Um, but the sooner you apply, the better your chances are getting exactly what you want. And uh, move on to the next slide real quick. Yeah, so this is the program that I was like, essentially like telling some of you um, that submitted questions uh, through our like webinar uh, feature, which is Ignite. Essentially, it's very low commitment. You're tutoring three to five students for like two to three hours hours a week, um, virtually specifically, right? So you could work around your your, uh, your current schedule. First years, sophomores, juniors, seniors, all open to, to that. And if you don't have those kinds of like leadership experiences or haven't worked with like low income students and you wanna see how it is, um, this is a perfect opportunity. Um, and again, applications will be opening up soon. So uh, I'll drop the link in the chat to sign up for that. Um, and hopefully we'll be talking in a month or two. And yeah, okay, cool. Awesome, thank you so much to our wonderful presenters today. We do have some good questions in the chat, so I'm gonna go ahead and ask those questions first, just to make sure that our students get their questions answered. Um, now, the first question we had was, how may a user experience designer or UX designer find service-driven work? So web design, app design, do you have, do you know of any opportunities that exist there for uh, folks wanting to go in this area? I would say um, not specifically, but if you're partnered with a nonprofit organization who has limited resources, right, that technological expertise is always going to be valuable. And so it's common for when the AmeriCorps team is partnering with a, a nonprofit, be it a food bank, be it an after school program, you know, they can use the, the, the skills and attributes of any of the volunteers that are serving there. And that could include things like updating their website, um, helping them with some IT challenges that they have. And so, yes, those skills could be useful, but there's not a specific job for that. I would say we're all, um, you know, part of organizations. So definitely check out like our career websites for all of us um, for Teach for America, City Year, Peace Corps, uh, and Triple C, because there might be like staff positions for like exactly what, what um, you're asking about. I don't know specifically um, because I only recruit for the AmeriCorps member position, but um, I know because we are a national organization, um, there might be an opportunity for um, a position with like web design. Um, but yeah, LinkedIn is also a great place to look for that. Um, 
but specifically within my organization, um, I can't speak to that directly, but um, I'll drop a link to our careers page as well. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Xavier, would you like to say something? Yeah, so for us, like we do have a lot of like people that are interested and have major in UI, UX or computer science that do come be teachers because there is such a big computer science kind of need and people with technical skills. Um, like one of my really good friends, he graduated from uh, Rice in, in Texas, I believe, and um, he was a computer science major there. And um, now he's essentially running the computer science program at the school that he was placed at. Right. So there's a lot of like ways to like use some of those skills um, for kind of like career service driven opportunities, even within like community work. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Xavier. So our next question. Hi, I am extremely interested in a service driven career post easy San Diego, but feel as though I need to be doing more to prepare myself or I'm not currently doing enough. Any advice on what makes an applicant stand out and is applying? Yes, I would like to answer that. Um, as I mentioned, any sort of volunteering experience that you have previously, as well as mentoring, leadership experience, it looks great on the resume, no matter you know where you apply. So I would say, if you, while you are a student, find something you're passionate about and volunteer there. It could be a nonprofit, it could be a church, it could be Boys and Girls Club. Um, working as a camp counselor also goes a long way in Peace Corps application because a lot of um, sectors, as you can see, is very inter interrelatable. And so you're going to be work with kids any, in any sort of case in, a, in some capacity. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, if you are uh, learning a foreign language or you, you you are bilingual or trying lingual that's a great asset so keep keep at it you know so that that's what I would like to you to focus on yeah and um I'll, I'll jump in there for our like application so I've like had candidates that you know I've been like presidents of clubs and stuff like that but I've also had applicants who like just have been working their entire like college career because that's the reality that a lot of students go through right it's a lot of like loans to go to university um so, you know, they do just your, your regular kind of like jobs that like 18, 19 year olds typically like do, which is like Starbucks, for example. Like one of my candidates was like a barista at Starbucks for three years, but they were able to explain how that kind of experience like impacted them and like how that shows leadership skills, right? So that you could find a lot of these skills within like your current work. It's just a matter of like building out the narrative and explaining how it specifically impacts you. So moving on to the next question, um, can you can each of you share in what ways you have grown since day one of your first nonprofit job up until this point? Oh wow, um, <laughs> a lot. Thankfully. Um, I would say I am definitely able to articulate my experiences a lot better. So like um, Javier was mentioning, like, you know, being able to say, like, not just say, like, oh, I just worked at Starbucks. Like, no, you worked at Starbucks. That is a hard job. You have to deal with customers. You have to deal with machines. You have to deal with, you know, handling money. Um, you know, you're, there's a lot of moving parts. So learning how to take your experiences and being able to articulate them in a way that they can transfer to different um, different opportunities um, has definitely helped. I think that also comes with just with age and with experience. Um, but yeah, being able to do that. Um, and then I think for me personally, not being afraid to ask questions or to make mistakes because that's going to happen. Um, so not being afraid to say like, hey, um, how do I find this specific thing or who do I talk to about this um, is definitely something that has helped me a lot, um, especially in the nonprofit world, um, because you might be working with really old data or really old systems. So just being able to be creative with like limited resources as well. Um, and then I think also not being afraid to delegate tasks. That was something that I learned with City Year. Um, 
specifically um, in my position. So at City Year, um, people on the team can have different roles. So I was the um, essentially the like events coordinator of my team. Um, and after my first event, we do like we did like a feedback um, session with like what went well, what could be improved upon, like what what should we do better next time. Um, and my teammates were like, "You were so stressed during this event. Like, please delegate stuff to us next time because that is what we're here for." So. That taught me that like, I don't need to take on the burden of everything, even though I am um, a bit of a control freak, um, <laughs> but just learning how to delegate and, and trusting my team that, okay, I'm gonna give you this task and I'm gonna trust that you're gonna do it. So um, those are some things that I've learned from my, my first position. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Allison. Brittany, you the presenters like to share their growth uh, throughout nonprofit. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'll just share that for me, starting on like the, the service journey with, with City Year and then going to Peace Corps and now working with AmeriCorps and Triple C, just the, the power of, of relationships. You know, it's if after doing City Year, there was um, definitely no way I would have gotten accepted into the Peace Corps if it wouldn't have been for my City Year experience. And then I wouldn't have gotten my position with AmeriCorps and Triple C if it wasn't for my Peace Corps experience. And then also knowing individuals who I worked with who, um, you know, when you're in the, the, the national service realm, it's a smaller world than, than you think oftentimes. And so a lot of times you may have personal relationships with individuals who um, maybe you had served with previously or who are now in leadership roles and how important it is to kind of maintain and foster those relationships as, as you move through your career. And so I, I would just say, you know, the networking aspect of it all is something that I learned and how important it is to, to show up and, and be present and to, to, to say yes whenever you feel comfortable for new experiences. You know, when somebody asks, hey, because a lot of times in the nonprofit world and in the government sector, too, it's a it's an all hands on deck effort and team effort on so many different initiative beca initiatives because of stretched resources and you often have to wear many different hats and so i think that if you're somebody who's flexible and willing to say oh yeah um i don't know exactly how to do that but i'm willing to learn i'm willing to give it my best and you'll step into all these different roles um you know within even my current role uh yes there's recruitment but there's all these different things event event planning media outreach elected official outreach that it's so many different positions kind of piled into one because of limited resources and so being able to kind of adapt and that flexibility is something that, that I learned was really important. Yeah, I could I could go next. Um, so me, like when I first started with, back when I was 19, working for like an astronaut nonprofit, I'm straight out of community college. I faced a lot of like imposter syndrome. Um, I don't know if you guys did, but you know, that's something I, I felt really, you know, like a lot, right? And thankfully, like I had like great like leaders and bosses that like helped work with me. So like understand like organizations, right? if you get accepted to any of these, like, you deserve to be there, right? Like, obviously, like, you'll, there will be, like, a skills gap, right? And it'll be tough, but you'll get through it, essentially. And um, that's, like, one of the main things that, like, I learned. I was just, like, eventually, like, these skills will come with time, right? And that's almost like any internship, right? Like, school doesn't really teach you a lot of, like, the skills that you need, um, but the job training does. And I know we, we all have, like, really strong, like, training <laughs> that we put our, our members through. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Xavier. So uh, my next question, I would like to uh, ask Anastasia, what are uh, some of the rewards that you or your organization have been able to experience, or what do you love most about your job being able to work with Peace Corps? I'm sorry, was it the rewards? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, what are some of the rewards that you or your organization have been able to experience? Or you can answer what you love most about working with Peace Corps. Well, working is a little different than actually volunteering. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I mean, I am enjoying both. I, this is sort of a full circle for me, again, uh, as a recipient of uh, Peace Corps programming. And again, uh, being able to serve as a volunteer in three different countries and then working for Peace Corps. That's just like dream come true, dream job. <laughs> um, I would say just being um, 
there, you know, just in a different setting, um, being uh, like a fish out of the water, but at the same time being accepted for who you are, um, because you, me, me, try to learn the local language, local culture, um, might be difficult to blend in completely, but um, that's what Peace Corps is actually um, doing a good job is in is making sure volunteers know the language and are as integrated as possible before diving in and doing projects because you cannot just do it as a sort of a American guest or tourist coming in and like, okay, I'm just gonna help you all. Like that's not how it works. Uh, so I would say what I'm very proud of is how conscious, conscientious Peace Corps is that the approach is community-based, grassroots based that first volunteers live in the communities first and foremost and getting to know community members, making friends, you know, forging these relationships. And then uh, through these connections actually um, attempt to do projects versus just coming in and, and you know, like a rescue of some sort and, and, and like, quote unquote, quote, helping. Because a lot of times communities actually can help themselves. Um, that, that's actually more, more, more true than the other way around. Um, but uh, what Peace Corps volunteers can do is um, gently point out at, at alternatives, for example, at, at uh, thinking outside of the box again, and uh, uh, figuring things out, uh, you know, finding creative ways in, in um, uh, solving old older problems. So this is what I'm basically very proud of. Would any other presenter like to help it? I'll go ahead, Xavier. Yeah, I like to go. Um, so like in the nonprofit space specifically, like we've been around for 30 years, right? But we're essentially trying to work ourselves out of a job, right? Like we go into like a community to solve an issue to eventually leave, right? It's the entire point. Um, at Teach for America, like some of the things that like we have accomplished, like one of the main ones is like we're diversifying the education space. Before us, education space looked a lot different, for example, right? Like teachers did not look like their students. Um, and, you know, that does have something to play, right? Um, one of the other things that I find personal, so I'm from like Newark, New Jersey, right? Um, there with our specific schools that we've been working with for over 20 years, we've been able to raise graduation rates from 52% to 74 right? And within like our 20 um, year span. So, you know, the fact that like we are getting results and eventually working to solve this issue, like really drives me. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Quinn, go ahead. Sure, I'll hop in real quick too. The thing I think is most rewarding about working for um, a program like NCCC is like a flexibility to respond to disasters or uh, needs as they rise. So for example, we may have a team out in Oregon doing an environmental project, but when Kabul fell in Afghanistan and refugees were being resettled to communities across the United States, a lot of the refugee resettlement agencies were overwhelmed by, by cases. And so AmeriCorps um, members were able to go directly to work with partnership resettlement organizations and help drive um, recent recent uh, refugees to appointments to um, get their apartments set up to find temporary housing uh, when COVID was in its worst situation um, and AmeriCorps and Triple C still operated and when programs like Habitat or food banks didn't have the volunteers needed to, you know, a lot of these nonprofits are reliant on volunteer support and when the pandemic happened, there was a huge gap. And so AmeriCorps was able to kind of bridge that gap by supplementing the volunteer force that was lost um, and also going into communities through like mobile vaccination clinics in partnership with FEMA to vaccinate the most vulnerable individuals in their homes, in their communities, on their blocks, um, in real time when things were happening. So I think what I love about this program is just the, the ability to respond to needs. Mm -hmm. in the Awesome. Thank you so much, Quinn. So we have just a couple of minutes left. I'm going to try to sneak in a last question. Uh, really briefly, can you share a tip 
or insight that you can provide for any of our attendees today who might be on the fence about joining your organization or working in a nonprofit in general. So let's start off with Allison. Can you take a stab at that? Yeah, I would say um, for city or specifically, um, just apply um, because you know, if you're kind of like, I'm not sure, um, you know, you still have to go through the interview and everything. And maybe after you do the interview, you're like, you know, this doesn't, this isn't for me. And that's okay. Um, I think it's still good experience to, you know, learn a little bit because not only are, are we interviewing you, um, you're kind of interviewing us. So I would say, you know, it's, it's a low, low stake to just like apply. And our application is pretty short and sweet, it maybe takes an hour to do. Um, and then our admissions process is about a month long. So after you apply within a month, you'll find out if you've been invited to serve. Um, and then I think you have like about two weeks to accept your invitation. So you have some time to think about it. Um, and then I would also say, um, definitely speak to a recruiter. Um, you have, we will provide our emails um, after this. Someone just put that in the chat. Um, I would say definitely like connect with us because if you have any burning questions, um, you know, all of us have served in these organizations so we can give you like firsthand experience. Um, so definitely like connect with us because you don't always get to connect with a recruiter and it's very beneficial for you to figure out like, okay, maybe I will apply. This does sound like a good opportunity for me or you know what, I think I'm going to pass, um, which is totally fine as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Allison, for that response. Um, yes, yeah, so here are the emails of our recruiters that have been a part of this presentation today. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us um, in this afternoon chat. We hope you got to learn something new, um, or we hope that we provide an opportunity for you to connect with each of us. So feel free to reach out with the recruiters on LinkedIn or their emails, and uh, they're all happy to continue this conversation with you. Thank you, everybody. All right, well, take care. Have a beautiful rest of your week, and enjoy your rest of your day. Bye. Thank you, bye. Sorry about y'all.